can you walk us through why the why you uh, did that uh, pivot into also servicing the aviation sector? Uh, so that's actually a bit of a unique story. Um, I remember actually I was sitting in an Earl's and I got a phone call from a gentleman that worked with um, Alberta Economic Development and Trade and his name was Michael Couch and he calls me and says, you know, are you interested in uh, joining us for a mission to Japan for an aviation conference? And the city of Leduc is going to sponsor part of your trip to mm. go. And I was actually five months pregnant at the time listening to this like, <laughs> where, <laughs> I was like, why would you ask me to go to an aviation? Yeah, stop telling people, stop people making you do stuff while you're pregnant. <laughs> well, I, was, I was like, okay, well, I'm like, um, well, I'm five months pregnant. I have no idea where I fit in aviation, like not a remote clue. I've never yeah. even remotely thought of that as a possibility. And I was also like, why would the city of Leduc want to sponsor us to go? But they'd been hearing about us and a really dear friend um, who was the uh, previous minister of uh, municipal affairs, Shay Anderson, was always just, he was an MLA around that area and just like a huge supporter. And uh, so I was like, all right, well, if you can bring me someone to my shop that's in the aviation space and they can see what I have and tell me where I fit, I'll consider going. So I was like, I don't want to waste any, uh, like, you know, our shareholder money or our, you know, what we have to, to go somewhere if it doesn't make sense, even though Japan would be great. So he actually ended up bringing the vice president of commercial real estate, Myron Keene, from the Edmonton airport, who brought two of their engineers. They brought in the chief pilot with Canadian North Airlines and a gentleman named Jeff Ritchie, who worked with the Alberta government. And they all came in to see it. And Jeff Ritchie was like, I think I've just seen the next Ram engine capable of space travel, which was amazing. And the aviation engineers are just rattling off a million things. And they're like, you need to come to Japan. You absolutely just come. So I was like, all right, I was going to have a nine week old baby at the time. So I had to pack up my husband and pack up my kids. And I was like, we're going wow. to Japan because I really, I think that there's something there. I guess there must be something there because they're excited about this. And I felt like I was hitting my head against a brick wall with uh, the oil and gas sector for a good mm. six or seven years because right when we were about to launch like our technology in oil and gas 2014 hit and right. it was, like rolling a boulder up a hill trying to get them to like try something new even with all the great results we were getting it hadn't been sold all over the place so they were they considered it too much of a risk so like let's give it a try. So I get to Japan and the second day of the conference I'm sitting down with like the mayor of Leduc. My, um, Myron from the airport and the head pilot for Canadian North and they take me around the trade show and they show me this aircraft heater and they're like this thing has not been redesigned in 60 years based on what you have did you design a system that could beat this and I was like all right well what are the big problems with it they're like well it doesn't heat the planes very efficiently it uses a ton of gas like diesel fuel it's mm -hmm. got a lot of emissions yada yada and uh, I was like yeah absolutely I'm pretty sure we could so we ended up, uh, three quarters of the people on that mission ended up actually investing in our company because the opportunity wow. the airport was so amazing. Canadian North was like, you can absolutely test on our airplanes. And the airport was like, we are going to partner with you. So we actually moved our location over to the Edmonton airport. They made us a member of the Alberta Aerospace Technology Center. Our first winter, we designed this kind of like proof of concept. And we're like, we want a third party to validate these results because we were doing um, from gas fuels, we had to convert to liquid and try and get the same results there. And they ended up bringing someone from Swiss port to kind of monitor the test to see what we got. And the guy just sat across the table from us and gave us our results. And he's like, you heated the plane in like half the time and you gave us like 58% fuel savings. Wow. Like, oh, I think we have something. So the airport came in and gave us like half the money to develop out a pre-production, like a proof of concept, a proper one. And by the second year of testing, we were into 72% reduction in fuel savings and something that we didn't even possibly expect. We could heat the airplane into temperatures of minus 40 with no support equipment. So a traditional unit is very, very large, uses about 20 to 22 liters of diesel fuel per hour. And it basically is a, it's a separate system and they produce heat with that system and they use a hose to put that heat into the airplane. And the airplane oh, okay. for two reasons. One, if you look at the bow of a plane, water lines go back and forth like this. And if the water lines freeze and the pipes burst, you have millions in damage. So that's kind of like the number one consideration. Every plane, the second it hits below minus 10, 
There's no choice, you have to have a system heating it. The second consideration, of course, is passenger comfort. But the traditional units like the Herman Nelsons and stuff are really effective, heating it from minus 10 to minus 20 on its own with those 22 liters of diesel. But when it hits below that, airlines have their own kind of mandatory, oh wait, now we have to turn on what they call an APU or a rear auxiliary engine. And on a Boeing 737-200, so something you'd use to go to like Vancouver or even California, it's 174 liters of jet fuel per hour. And you still have to have the piece of equipment standing outside of it, which is 22 liters of diesel an hour. But the second the jet engine's on, now you have a third cost, which is an engineer or someone qualified to sit in the cockpit to make sure that the heat is evenly distributed throughout the plane. We came with our system. It's seven liters of diesel an hour to minus 40, no APU, no engineer in the cockpit. The environmental impact of heating a plane, that was pretty dramatic. And then the cost savings associated with heating the plane was really dramatic. So the Edmonton Airport was beyond thrilled with what we had designed. And the way we designed the system was that it would do way more than just heating an aircraft. You could use it in construction. You could use it to heat just general space heating. You could use it in greenhouses. You could use it to heat a hangar. So it was really versatile extremely easy to use the way we automated the system. You just push a button and it starts and it regulates its own temperature for whatever you want it to be at. Well, it's, uh, I, I, I hate you get, you gave a lot of good information and now I'm probably going to ask the, about the worst layman question you can ask, but uh, it, the, I think you touched on it briefly as well. The typically there's a flame and there's a, there is a, downside to having uh, an exposed flame you've you've obviously it ob- you said it creates damage so that must be a major factor that your burner doesn't have a flame that's 20 or 40 feet out into the atmosphere right i mean just physically the damage around it and having to protect that or having to protect the things that are in its vicinity and like you said having to have the burner a certain distance away from the plane. I mean, that must be a huge factor in, in, in the value of it as well, right? Uh, well, it's actually a reason why most don't use direct fire. They call them direct fire systems. They would use things like, you know, those big engines that you'd see in a semi-truck going up and down the highway? Mm-hmm. They use like engines and try and push the heat from the engine into the airplane. Because oh, trying to I close see. that kind of heat, like with a flame, is, it's not a simple task. It, yeah okay right so they they would use electric systems they would use engine systems they wouldn't use burner systems our competitive advantage came from the fact that we transfer so much heat with with a lot smaller btu value so if they're using an engine diesel is what they call a one-to-one conversion so if you need a million btu you need a million btu worth of fuel there's absolutely no getting around that but what we focused on was what temperature do you need to exit this machine to enter this aircraft. That's all we want to know. What's the temperature? And they're like 220 degrees. We're like, well, we produce over 3,700 degrees C off a quarter million BTU. So our issue is actually, how do we reduce the heat of our system to be able to go down to 220 degrees, not try and force it to ramp up to 220 degrees. So that took us three years to be able to dissipate our heat with um, mm. like our own heat transfer mechanism to be able to give the low amount of heat that they were just looking for. 